So, hi. hi. Uh, it's very weird to hear myself. People keep my full name. And the story behind that is that when back in the late 80s, and I was still a fairly young curator at the New York Museum, I got embroiled in the debacle at Grant's tomb. And I don't know if any of you followed that. But I ended up being the named plaintiff in a lawsuit against the federal government, the Department of the Interior, for neglecting a presidential gravesite. Which was true. And it wasn't the Park Service, it was the federal government who didn't think grants too mattered. And so, so and because of my name, they decided to use me. And, and then my boss at the New York Museum said, you know, they're paying attention to your name, so we're going to use your full name on your business card. From now on. <laughs> so that's how that all evolved. And there's, there's a, that's a whole other story. But just to, to clarify, so I am the youngest of 41 great-great-grandchildren of U.S. Grant, and of whom there are a lot fewer since I'm the youngest at 68. So, uh, and there's still a bunch of us out there, but it was a, it was a, a, it's a big family. There are two more, three more generations of people below me, including two more Ulysses. There's a Ulysses S. Grant the sixth who lives in Missouri, and there's a little French teenager named Ulysse Sartorus. Uh, whose mother is the woman in white, whose great grandmother is the woman in white up on the porch there. And I met him once too. He was fascinated because neither of us had ever met another Ulysses in the family. Because even in the family, it was not a popular name. And so, with, with, so with that and, and the fact that I ended up in New Jersey, I will give you a little New Jersey history about U.S. Grant. But I had never been in New Jersey until I came to visit and then got the job here. I've spent most of my life in New Jersey now, so that's the way history rolls. Now, can you all see? I think actually I was sitting on the back bench. You guys can read this actually from here. So I have kind of wonky eyesight, so I'm a good test for all of this. So Kelly is going to yes. change the buttons for me. And I, oh, not yet. I wasn't done yet. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go. But the, I, I realized that I wanted to call this Ulysses and Julia Grant because. The more I learn about them, and this has been true from the first time I spoke at Grant's tomb in 1987, when I knew absolutely nothing, but I knew enough to know that she's in the tomb with him and there's a reason for that. And uh, I think about it that even at the Grant Presidential Library, I'm on the board of the Presidential Library, which is in, anybody know? I know you know, you're a reader. You don't know? Oh, well, you know, you're another <laughs> But it's, it, it's at Mississippi State University in Starkville, Mississippi, and there's a story there which I can tell you later, but not during this. Uh, but I'm on the board of that, and I realized that I, I that in, there's a museum there now, and Julia doesn't show up in that. It's really all about him. It's about his military career, more and more about his presidential career, because he's much underrated as a president. And remember, I grew up called Grant. <coughs> I was Grant Dietz, not Ulysses Dietz. And it's because that if I would tell them who I was related to, people would instantly make fun of him, as if I would think he was a joke, too. So it was a very challenging thing for a teenager in the 60s, for a kid in the 60s and a teenager in the 70s, to deal with this issue of this name, because the history had been badly written or miswritten. Uh, and people like Louis Bacone, who had written such great stuff about it, too, I recommend his book. And you're not going to pay for this. <laughs> uh, but so I, it, it's become my sort of personal passion uh, to think about the family, and not just about his family when he was alive, but the, the impact of his life on his descendants. And I'll touch a little bit on that, mostly through the personal side of things. Because frankly, my grandfather was Ulysses S. Grant III, and he was the single most active descendant of the president through most of his lifetime. Uh, and I didn't even know that while he was alive, because he was just grandpa, uh, and he had my name, and he, would, he never talked to me about that. So, But let's, let's now we'll go to the first slide, because I do know a man. As anyone who's heard me speak, you will know I can wander down. I can go off track quite easily, so I'll try to pay attention. So I, this is another shot. I'm going to start at the end, and then we'll come back to the end. But this is one of the last, the, one of the last family photographs of a, a group of these that were taken in the summer of 
1885, right before U.S. Grant died in uh, Wilton, New York, at Mount McGregor, in a, co in a cottage, which I'll talk about again. But here he is gathered, I can't even, now I can't remember what the next slide was, but let's go to the next slide and see what I did. <laughs> oh, no, that was not the next slide. Okay, go back. <laughs> Depends on, I've given other talks too, and there's one where I zero in on the people more. But he is, get, he is surrounded by his children here, I think all four of his children, no, but yes, Buck is over on the left, his son Ulysses S. Grant Jr., who was his second son, and I point him out always, because he's, he's not my great-grandfather. The, old, the older guy, who's all of 32 or something, standing in the middle with the beard is my great-grandfather, Fred. Frederick Kent Grant, who was the, uh, uh, the eldest son and the one who went into the military. The baby, Jesse, is the dashing looking one over on the right, who I think of as the spoiled child. And then there's the daughter, Nellie, their only daughter, is dressed in white. And each of them has a very complicated story, and I will not go into that. But it's uh, uh, they were devoted and doting parents, and the impact of their presence in their children's lives shaped each of those children in a very different way. Uh, but keep track of, well, let's see, I was trying to remember what, see this, I haven't practiced this in a while, and I'm trying to remember what joke I tell here. The little, the grumpy toddler with the straw hat is my grandfather. And to the left of him, the slightly distracted eight-year-old girl is my great-aunt Julia. And I knew them. So I, the fact that I knew people who were actually in this photograph all sort of boggles my mind. But I actually always feel that I know these other people, too, because I learned a lot about them. So Uncle Buck, as my mother called him, Uncle Buck, over on the left, who was born in 1852, uh, Went to Harvard, and then went to Phil or went to Phillips Exeter Academy, and then went to Harvard. So I went to Phillips Exeter Academy, and my and I'm born on the same day he was, but I went to Yale. So, <laughs> and I don't know what that means, but it's always felt to me like I had this. He was the second son in the family. I was the second son in my family. Four children, one girl. Four children, one girl. So somehow, none of this means anything except I'm romantic, so it all feels like it means something to me. Okay, now let's go on to the next slide. Because I'm not gonna go too deep, because I always, when I speak, you're a group of history buffs, so you know history, but I don't know how much history you know or how specific it is, and I always assume everybody knows everything about everything, but of course I realize I don't know that much about Robert Cleveland, except what I've learned from George, who I've known through mutual uh, committees we're on. And, and so I'll give you the outlines and you can ask me questions and we'll see. When I started this journey back in the 1980s, uh, when I was at the Newark Museum and realized I could be useful, uh, I realized I didn't need, I didn't know anything. And people would come to me at U.S. Grant Association meetings and say, which, was, which book of U.S. Grant did you read recently? And I thought, what? <laughs> there are recent books? And so I, I, had to, you know, I had to do a lot of building up it. As I said, I confessed at dinner today, uh, I never liked history. And I drew it, I, I fell into history through the decorative arts, through the history of houses and the history of the stuff inside houses, which is cultural history. So I think of myself as a cultural historian, but that actually opened me up to actual history, but also the shift in the way history has been written in the last 35, 40 years has really changed and made me a much more willing history reader. So that's why I know anything about what I'm talking about tonight. I, I love these are, it's very hard to find, of course, in the days before photography, uh, you don't really get images of people, and ordinary people didn't have portraits of themselves painted back in the 1820s when these two were born. But Julia and Ulysses are both children of the American frontier in the 19th century. And one of the things that fascinates me uh, is not only is it one of the great love stories of America in the 19th century, uh, but, and really, if they ever make a Ron Chernow's book into, into a, a movie rather than just a history channel thing, it can't be a musical because he, had, he was totally <laughs> time deaf. But it could be a romance. This is, this is better than Brett Butler and Scarlett O'Hara because the marriage lasted. <clears throat> but they were both born on the frontier and they were born into very different families that were both right on the edge of the conflict that would tear the country apart in the 19th century. 
Both of them, well, and you'll hear more about that. But, uh, so that's Ulysses before he grew a beard, so this is probably right out of West Point, 1843, something like that, when he graduates. And Julia, obviously, is in the age of photography. She's probably already married to him, but that's probably in the early 1850s. Next slide. And they're, and, here, and they're born in, in two very different families, but not as different as people used to play up in the stereotypes. He is born in this tiny uh, three-room cabin on the banks of the Ohio River in Point Pleasant, Ohio. His parents are, well, his mother is a devout Calvinistic Methodist named Hannah, who, who is so conscious of not being proud that she never visits the White House, is that, because that would be Whereas her husband, who was a loudmouth and a politician and a striver and an entrepreneur and actually quite successful financially, uh, was also an ardent abolitionist. And so that's the way he grows up. He, his father, he's the oldest child, who has grand is the oldest of how many? Six children? I should know that off the top of my head. But he is adored by his father, who is a complete pain in his butt through his whole life. <laughs> that he pushes him, he challenges him, he criticizes him. Ulysses is quiet and introspective, like his Methodist mother, uh, and his father is pushy and loud and aggressive. Uh, that makes him sound like a bully. And I think he was a bit of a bully, but the fact is he adored his son, but he always had, he always had his eye on the first opportunity. And, and if, this, if I remember this later on, I'll bring it up because that's, that's a whole wartime thing. Uh, and then Frederick Fayette Dent, who is my great, great, great grandfather, on the other side is someone I never think of as my great, great, great grandfather because the fact is he was a slave owner from Maryland who had a thousand acres outside of St. Louis, Missouri in a plantation called White Haven, which they always refer to as a farm, and I guess it was just a farm, but in the South it would have been called a plantation. And he had anywhere between 10 and 20 slaves in the course of his career as a, as a big scale farmer and a wealthy farmer outside of St. Louis. Uh, the house is currently painted green. That's a color that U.S. Grant and Julia painted it when they inherited the house after uh, Fred died. But th th these are two people who I've thought of a lot because Jesse Grant adored his son, but was a difficult father. Frederick Dent adored his daughter and was not a difficult father, but he was a slave owner, so he becomes problematic to us today. But he also taught U.S. Grant the more gentle emotions of how it is to live in a loving family, uh, without criticism, without challenges, without defiance. And Ulysses would sit and talk to his father-in-law about the pros and cons of slavery, which were mostly cons on Grant's side and pros on his father-in-law's side. And both of these men eventually would come and spend a lot of time in the White House. And there are some fairly funny stories if I can think of them later. Uh, they may, I may put one of them in this. But they were completely polar opposites in who they were in America, yet they both lived in the West. And they lived in exactly the same generation. And they represent the sides of America that are equally powerful and exist to this day. And they raised two very different children who fell in love almost instantly. Next, please. Uh, and then you know, and they, they matured as a couple. U.S. Grant went off to Mexico, fought the Mexican War, which he wrote in his memoirs. Basically, the Mexican War gave us the entire West, Texas West to the coast. Uh, and he said it was the most unjust war any country has ever weighed in against an innocent country. We attacked Mexico. We provoked Mexico so that we could take the land away from it. And he said that. I mean, he, that he was, for a man who ended his whole life, working in the army. He had he liked the military world, but he didn't believe in military politics or the use of military in war. Uh, and needless to say, what everybody remembers, what I was always sort of taught growing up, was that Grant was an utter failure of everything he ever did until the Civil War started. And the fact is, he certainly had a lot of setbacks. Uh, and the fact is also, in the near years he grew up, this country went through depression after depression after depression, and millions of people were always out of work and struggling to survive, and he was just one of them. He tried to be a farmer after, 
He went in, he was in the army, he has a baby, his wife is pregnant, and they ship him to California. So several years later, he can't stand it. That's where all the rumors about his drinking started up. And he probably did drink. He drank when he was away from his wife, and never when he was with his wife. He was lonely and bereft, and he adored her, and she didn't write him letters, and he couldn't get letters in Fort, Fort Vancouver, and then there was another one, Fort Humboldt, on the West Coast, totally isolated in the middle of nowhere on the West Coast, no trains, no access, no mail. So he came home, and it took him months to get home because he had to keep borrowing money uh, to get fare, and he had to go all the way around South America, back up to New York, and then he worked his way back to St. Louis, where he worked on his, his father wouldn't help him, because his father was making a lot of money in the leather business, but his father-in-law, of course, the Lord it over him, and to prove to his daughter that this man was never going to be any good for you, uh, allowed him to work his farm. And of course, U.S. Grant wasn't very good at working with slaves, because he treated them as equals, and he worked with them in the fields, and he was the subject of gossip in the neighborhood that he had no clue how to work with slaves. He actually owned a slave briefly. His name was James William Jones. See, it sounds like an investment firm, but I think it's William Jones. <laughs> and he owned him for less than that. We, it, how we got him is, in fact, a question. And I have a feeling that Fred Dent finagled him to give it to give this man to him in payment for a debt, just to force him to own a slave and to free him. This is a this is when U.S. Grant was uh, working in Hard Scrabble, which he helped build with his neighbors, uh, a house which his wife always found shaming, and his father-in-law probably enjoyed immensely because it knocked him down a peg and again proved to Julia that this man is never going to be any good and. Uh, and so he's struggling with this farm of several hundred acres outside of St. Louis on his father-in-law's property. Uh, and he has this one uh, farm worker who's enslaved who he owns, who's worth $1,500 money then, and he sets him free because he can't deal with the idea of owning a slave. Those many mission papers survive. And then he finally gives up on this and he says to his father, help me, please, what can I do? So his father sends him to Galena, Illinois, to work in, in one of his the branches of his leather goods shop with his brothers, and he becomes the bookkeeper because he's very good at math, something I did not inherit from him. <laughs> um, and he and his wife live in this house. They live in this house on High Street in Galena, which I've been to. It's now a bed and breakfast, so you can go stay there. But I've been to it several times. Uh, and the Methodist church he went to was right next door. He was always a reluctant churchgoer, but he went because his because Julia was a devout Methodist. He was not baptized until he was dying by the by the famous Bishop Newman, uh, and uh, who also christened my grandfather and I have his christening Bible. Uh, and uh, but so he stopped being a failure here. He he got a job. He could support his family. He had four children. He loved walking up the hill to his house every night and wrestling with his little boys on the, on the parlor floor, and he had a happy life. And then the war broke out and changed his life completely, because he felt the call to go back into the army and to defeat the South and restore the Union. Slavery wasn't the issue he was interested in at first, and that would change. I'm not going to get too deeply into that, but it wasn't really his issue, because he had lived his whole life on the edge of slavery. He had known it in Kentucky, where he went to school in Mays, uh, Maysville across the river. And his family were abolitionists. There were no slaves in Ohio. But right across the liver, the liver, river, he knew that. And of course, Julia had grown up with slaves. When she married him in 1848, her father assigned her four of the slaves she had grown up with. So think about that as a sort of creepy story. And those slaves stayed with her until they were forced to be freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. <laughs> so the general who was fighting slavery in the South has a wife who travels with him on the battlefield more than any other wife of any Union general because she has the freedom of unpaid servants to keep her household going as they move around the country. And there's a lot more to be told about that, but it's a fascinating irony. And all the children remember being raised by these slaves. Uh, and 
Only two of them actually wrote about it. Now, let's see, should I say, go to the next slide, let's see what I say here. Because I'm rambling on because I'm thinking of all sorts of things that I care about. Because I really want to get to is this whole dancing on the edge of the Gilded Age thing. Uh, the picture on the left is, is an example of that. This is where that story might have come in. Julia and Ulysses and Jesse. Julia shown in profile because she had strabismus and was cross-eyed. Uh, and strabismus means your eyes aren't always crossed, but if, you, if you're looking around, your eyes are fine, but as soon as you stop, one of them turns in. And she was very self-conscious of that. And of course, photographs were a problem. And it's the earliest photograph we have of her is of holding a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And she's looking at the camera, and you can see she's cross-eyed. And that picture must have freaked her out, because she tries never to be photographed face on. But here they are at, at his cabin at City Point, which is toward the end of the Civil War in Virginia. Uh, and, and she's there with him. She moved around a great deal, which is remarkable. She'd leave some of the kids with her father and take, you know, um, take whichever one was most convenient. Uh, Fred was in Vicksburg when he was 14 years old and got wounded in Vicksburg because he disobeyed his father and took his pony across enemy lines and got hit with shrapnel. So there, and he's in the Illinois Memorial at Vicksburg because he was there. He wasn't even in the army. But my point about this picture is that Ulysses and Julia were married in the West, lived the lives of struggling Westerners as so many did, because he wasn't his father was making money, his father-in-law was making money, but he wasn't making money until he got this job in Galena. And then he went into the war. And he made money because he, was, he became a general. And then he got out of the war and he got a job in Washington with a huge salary. So their lives changed tremendously. But after the war, they returned to Galena triumphantly and they were taken around the town and presented with this fully furnished 10 room <laughs> villa, like a dream house out of the suburbs, as a gift for thank you for saving the Union. <laughs> And, of course, that was, and they were thrilled, and Julie was thrilled, because this is the nicest house she'd lived in uh, since she'd been married. But they set their sights elsewhere. As soon as, in 1865, he was already the head of the armies and had to go to Washington. And Julia, they lost interest in Galena pretty quickly, and they actually turned it over to the state as a museum in, like, 1908. So it, 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 it left the family pretty quickly, but it was always a symbol of the, the country's gratitude to them. And it was Julia's vindication that her dear Ulysses, Ulysses as she called him, had triumphed, had become who she always knew he could be. Next, please. Oh, and just because I'm a nerdy decorative arts curator, I love this house. If you're ever in Galena, it's a very cute town, but it's worth seeing because you don't get this surviving very often in America, a middle, a middle, upper middle class, spec built villa, completely furnished with all of its original furniture intact. It was all furnished, it was like a show house. So it had all of the earmarks of gentility, which Julia craved to have, and which Ulysses didn't much care about, but got used to as he got older and more used to it. But he had a library, they had a dining room, they had a parlor, they had five bedrooms, they had a big modern kitchen, they had a bathroom, and it was everything, it was a dream house for the American dream as it existed at the very beginning of the Gilded Age, which is where this, the point is. This starts after the Civil War. So, oh, you can see her quote, we were conducted to a lovely villa, exquisitely furnished with everything good taste could desire. So Julia, like housewives of her time, was obsessed with fulfilling the ideal of being the genteel American housewife, because that was the highest goal a woman could hope for. And I don't mean to make that sound negative, but that was the highest goal they could hope for. That's what they dreamed of. Next, please. And this is just a little primer. Is what is the Gilded Age? It's a term that, that bizarre TV show, which I watch faithfully, because I know all those houses in that show because I've done a lot of work in Newport. But what does the Gilded Age mean? The Gilded Age is a uniquely American construct that is not referred to in the period at all, except by Mark Twain, who uses it as an ironic term in his book, The Gilded Age. But it's the post-Civil War, and it runs until about World War I. And what it really is, is the moment when the slave economy, which is the bulk of the American wealth, 
disappears because of the war, because of U.S. war in one way or another, and the industrial economy takes off. And the, the, the label I saw in the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis it sticks with me, that the value of the slaves in 1850 in America was worth more than the entire investment in everything else in America. And when people don't understand why the Southerners didn't want to give up slaves, it's because it was most of the American economy was tied up in slave labor. And the North was just as linked into it as the South was, but indirectly. So that economy disappears, and all of the aspects of the industrial economy rise up. And let's go to the next slide and see if I said something. Aha, I did. Because it's like, so it's gold in California. It's oil in 1858 in Pennsylvania, Rockefeller. Uh, it's other natural resources, coal, uh, lumber, all of these things. And then to go with that, the land, the real estate, which has to be taken away from the Indians and sold to people and split up. And then, then you begin to use the resources to make stuff. But then you have to build railroads to move stuff. Uh, and then you have to have stores to sell stuff, and wholesale stores to sell stuff by railroad to other stores. So that's where Sears was getting all of its stuff from, by railroad from all across the country. And then, of course, you have bankers to organize things, brokers to sell the stocks that have to do with the manufacturers, and, of course, where my family comes in, lawyers. Because U.S. Grant, well, I can't even figure out how to explain that. I'll get there. Um, there's a lawyer in my family who plays a role in all but this is where the Gilded Age comes from. It's this the shift from uh, 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 not so much a rural economy, because we have cities, but uh, an economy that is very decentralized and, and, and still driven by the slave trade, and then this whole new economy that rises after. Oh, is it now? Lewis, you may know this. It's a book called Lincoln on the Verge. Mm -hmm. Who's the author? Uh. I met him and I read the book and I loved it. I'm so bad at all this name. But it's a, it's literally just a story about Lincoln when he's elected, traveling from Illinois to the inauguration in Washington. But it's actually the story because it's the same time that Jefferson Davis is going by boat, trying to get to Richmond for his inauguration, with a completely different set of circumstances because the technology in the Deep South is completely absent. North, it's booming. And this story of Lincoln going by train, trying not to get assassinated uh, to Washington, is the story of what's happening in the North at the beginning, at, at, before the Gilded Age gets going. Next, please. That's Ed Whitmore. Uh, Ed Whitmore. 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 Ted Whitmore. And it's, it's a really fun book. It's the kind of history book that I like to read. <laughs> And so what do they do? Now, I'll really get that, that I've been derailing myself constantly. Because Julia is very excited about this, because she gets to go to Washington, she goes to the White House, she meets Mary Lincoln, who she does not hate, but who is difficult. And Julia manages her very well and is always polite with her and enjoys her company. Uh, she's the first lady, after all. But U.S. Grant has this big job, so they buy this enormous house in Georgetown, for, as it says, for 30,000 in 10 years to pay for it. Uh, and, and she talks about this, and she keeps saying, well, we couldn't really afford it, but it was such a nice house. And she says this again and again in the course of their lives. So they settle into this house between 1865 and 1869, and Julia sets up a society. She has portraits painted, she has parties, she's very social for all the fact that she's plump and cross-eyed. She uh, is a great social butterfly. She's the opposite of her husband. She's an extrovert and he's an introvert. So she takes over this. He can settle into a party and sit in the corner and talk to people while she nags on and fusses over the food. And I, because I'm a decorative arts curator, and this is actually in the New Museum now, I'm really interested in what she bought. Because this is the rise of the great brand name retailer. So she goes to Tiffany's uh, right after her husband becomes famous, and she goes and buys silver, and, and this salver has her initials on it. So next, please. This is that's in the Newark Museum. Uh, uh, none, none of this is in there. No, some of it is. But she orders a huge Chinese export porcelain service with his monogram on it in the Victor's Laurel rate. And you know they always say U.S. Grant ordered it. I think I don't think U.S. Grant cared about China very much. 
I mean, in the country, yes, but not the stuff. But she orders this huge, quite famous now, uh, uh, service of 360 pieces of monogram Chinese porcelain. So she's feeling the money that she's got. She also goes out, there's a piece of a picture of the spoon uh, at the top. She buys this whole set of flatware designed by Dora during the Civil War. Flatware being designed for, for wartime uh, and because it has not only ladies, Ro Roman ladies on it, but it has Roman warriors on it. So I have some of this, these, these are mine. But I, a cousin of mine sold them and I went on. I helped him sell them and then went online and bought some. Uh, so Judith is buying the goods, she's buying the new stuff so that she can live the life she wants to live in that big house in Georgetown. Next please. So she's got the Gilded Age thing going and in 1867, when they've got that big house, they buy a house at the Jersey Shore in uh, Long Branch. And the Grant Cottage, which survived until I was alive, but had been much altered. But it was a classic kind of modern seaside cottage with porches all around it, uh, lots of fresh air. And she talks about it. This is a quote from the Gilded Age, Mark Twain's book. And one of the women who is sort of a schemer asks the dowager in Washington, she says, Long Branch and Cape May are nearer than Newport, speaking of the Gilded Age. Doubtless these places are low, meaning not classy. And the dowager says, there are nobody goes there in this hall because I wish I could get the accent right. I don't know what Washington accent was. At least only persons of no position in society and the president. <laughs> so, and this is when Mark Twain becomes aware of the rest. He's caught up in all the turmoil of his two terms in office. But I love the fact that Julia talks about this, these are from her memoirs, that they go, here they are in Long Branch with two of their African-American servants uh, who had both been enslaved before and had stayed with the family. And she talks about he would get exhausted in Washington and would go, this is sort of the beginning of the summer White House, although Lincoln had a summer White House in Washington. Uh, and so this becomes the place where the president goes on the weekends. You can get there in a couple of hours on the train. And they kept this until almost uh, the time when he died and they were forced to sell up a lot of their real estate late, later in his life. So they really become, this is like living the dream. They have the big house in Washington and the summer house on the shore. I mean, if that's not an archetype for what happens today, I don't know what is. Next, please. And then, of course, the brass ring. You know, Julia loves her husband's ambition and pushes him. And she loves the idea of being the first lady. And I don't think she cares that much about politics, but she does pay attention. She's not an idiot. And, and she is also, there have been books written about this too, that, that she is one of the most influential, both before and after his presidency, of, of in, in the president's life, because they really are a team. And they depend on each other for so much. So these are images of what the White House looked like about the time of the Grant's arrival in 1869. Uh, the, the fountain in the middle of the South Lawn existed already, but the Grant built a big reflecting pool around it. And Julia does something else. I love this image of the front of the White House with people standing outside because she closed the grounds. The President's Park was open to the public. People could wander around the grounds of the White House uh, after Lincoln's assassination, security got a little more panicky and tighter. But Julia said, I have a little boy. He wants to be able to play with his friends. This is his yard. And she closed the grounds to the public. So you had to get in through security gates uh, to get to see the president. And mind you, the president's office is upstairs on the left side. What is that? East and the east wing. Is that east? North? East, yes, it's the east side. Now it's the west wing, but it was the east side upstairs. So the whole half of the upstairs of the house was president's offices for a long time. That's another story. Next, please. And then Julia does what she has always wanted to do. I joke about this, because I'm sure she thinks of, I, there's some version of this talk where I give a, show a picture of, of uh, Tara and Scarlett O'Hara, and then show Whitehaven and Julia. Uh, because Julia saw herself as this kind of Southern belle, and she even talks about herself that way. And so she walks into the White House and she's not intimidated by it at all, although every house she ever lived in could fit in the East Room. And, and she just goes to work. And at first, uh, Congress doesn't give her very much money, 
so she does what she can. And, and I point out that these are both souvenir stereo cards from the 18th, uh, late 60s, early 70s, showing Julia's first go at the house. They don't remotely reflect the colors that were used. They just made it up. The blue room was blue, so they painted some blue yeah. stuff on it. I really doubt that Julia had white carpeting in the East Room that had tended to have 50,000 visitors a year. Uh -huh. um, so that's not going to last. But you can see the effect. She puts the chandelier in. She puts the new curtains and the new upholstery and the new carpeting. But all the furniture is from earlier presidents. And I, I wrote a book on the White House, so I could tell you who owned all of that stuff, and you don't care. But or maybe you do care. <laughs> this crowd might care. But, but she, she makes the White House her own. She redoes uh, the state dining room, new carpeting, new chandeliers, the, the big, the great Monroe centerpiece. She has it expanded because it's not big enough, and she throws a lot of parties. And I can tell you, none of that furniture comes from her. The only thing that's from her is the chandeliers. Uh, next, please. And then she orders a new set of furniture for the cabinet room, the old cabinet furniture that belonged to Andrew Jackson and Paul. She says, that ah, out of all that stuff, we're getting all new modern stuff from New York. And that, and the cabinet table is still being used. I don't know if Biden is using it now, but Obama used it as his desk. There's a picture of uh, G.W. Bush with his feet up on it in his office. And that's this room, was the cabinet room is now the president's study. Uh, so, but that, and that's under McKinley, that photograph. But, but Julia makes sure to furnish this from a big New York furniture, uh, Poitier and Steinus, so that her husband has modern furniture. I can't believe they crammed the whole cabinet around what is about the size of a small dining table, but there you are. And then she makes a mark elsewhere. This, this is the most hilarious. In the green room and the red room, she refreshed uh, Andrew Johnson's daughter, Martha Patterson's decoration, she refreshed it, put in new carpets. Uh, but basically, it was stuck with everything else. The furniture came from the Buchanan era. But she has this, she commissions a life-size equestrian portrait of her husband, which she leans on the wall in the green room. Because she doesn't go into the green room. That's like the official room for parties. So she puts her mark in, I think, we don't know where that, it was painted by a man named Cogswell. And I don't know if it still exists, but it's pretty, this came from the house in Georgetown. So she had floor-to-ceiling paintings in her house in Georgia. <laughs> Next, please. And then the red room, I love this. This is a stereo card from the New York Public Library. And again, she refreshes the red room. Uh, this is, uh, the piano came from upstairs, and she brought it downstairs. But there's Mrs. Tyler's marble, marble center table, which will get broken during the Taft administration. And then the furniture from Mrs. Polk from the 1830s, uh, 1840s. So she's using the old furniture, but she commissions this portrait of the family, the royal family, with herself at the center for the red room, which is their parlor. That's the room they use every day. And this is where she reigned over the White House as the first lady and loved every minute of it. It's a slightly blurry image, but there's engraved, this became a popular engraving so people could have this in their home. And she's there with her children, and her husband is standing obediently at her side, dressed as a general, because he's still a general when she has this painting. Next, please. See, when he comes into the White House, he has to drop his commission. He has to leave the army. And just to remind you, if I don't remember it later, that presidents do not get a pension, and he's left the army, so he has no military pension. And that will come up again later, and it will involve Grover Cleveland. So just to show you, the thing that Julia does that I love most is, uh, and, and I'm sure that Ulysses was interested in this because he had a beautiful billiard table that he had made for the other house. And so she builds on the roof next to the greenhouses, which are sprawling outside the White House, she has a billiard room built. So that this becomes the family room for the Grants during their two, uh, two terms in office. And this is a recreated image. Of, there's a lot of descriptions of it, but there's a, there, is a, there is one photograph that shows it from the outside. But so she really, what do you need if you're, a, if you're a Gilded Age millionaire? You need a billiard room. They have a library upstairs in the Oval Room, but they have all these rooms, but there's no place, you know, there's no man cave where they can smoke cigars and spit. Uh, and you do see pictures of the White House with spittoons all over the East Room. So next slide. But, and that, that survives a few presidencies, but this is something she adds to the White House. But the other side of the Gilded Age, of course, is the money side of it. And if any of you were watching the TV series, 
Uh, George Russell is a wonderful fantasy of uh, possibly this man, but I think he's an amalgam of several other people. Uh, but you have the robber barons who don't get named that right away. Uh, they, that actually comes in later. But Jay Gould and his business partner, Jim Fisk, go out to corner the gold market. And they try to corner U.S. Grant into that. And, and Grant is still struggling with the fact that the government doesn't run like the army does. Just because he's the president, Congress doesn't do what he tells them to do. In fact, they expect him to do what they tell him to do. So it becomes an issue. And he actually staves off the cornering of the gold market, bankrupting any number of financial institutions in the process, and making his first wave of enemies who were looking for ways to discredit him for the rest of his career. But I love this image of Jay Gould with the sort of slightly devilish wisps of hair swinging between the pillars of, uh, I can't re even read what they are anymore, but it's basically about the financial greed of the totally uncontrolled consumer capitalist economy that's going on. And in retrospect, people got all like holier than thou in the 20th century about this. But this is the way things ran. Patronage and giving, giving jobs to your relatives, all of this was standard fare. Uh, and eventually, reform would happen. But he gets caught up in, a, in the problems. You can see U.S. Grant running toward them uh, in the background of the Jim Fisk cartoon. Next, please. And then, back to what I'm interested in, <laughs> just to remind you that the real world exists out there, the ugly world of politics and finance, but the second term in office, when he is swept back into office with a smaller majority but still wins easily, but Julia says, okay, I'm getting more money from Congress, and I'm gonna really make this place into a modern house that befits my beloved husband. Julia thinks about this place like she's gonna live there forever. So she tears out this, of course, as a his architectural historian makes me cringe, she tears out Hoban's neoclassical staircase, which takes up all the space, and puts in a sidewinder staircase that goes up toward the, the billiard room through those doors, uh, so that she can have a sitting room upstairs. It's the birth of the West Sitting Hall uh, in the West Wing of the White House. And then she dusts up the Red Room again, new carpeting, and she goes to New York and she buys all this fancy furniture from the most fashionable furniture maker in the city, a guy named Herder Brothers, or a firm called Herder Brothers, because that's what all the rich people on Fifth Avenue were doing. So, and some, a couple of pieces of that still survive. But so she's beginning to spend money, and then her next slide, her big deal is the East Room. So she totally transformed the East Room, and if I had the power of all the money in the world, I would rebuild her East Room, because it was really dazzling. The massive, 20 by 40, or 40 by 80 by 22 foot east room. The 18th century beams were sagging, and so she had to find ways to shore it up, but also make it into sort of a glittering palatial room. It's all gold and white. Uh, it's all, it, and these massive 14 foot high chandeliers uh, just transformed the place into a really dazzling room. And in fact, by the, when it was built, it was the largest ballroom in America. And it gets outstripped by people like the Vanderbilts pretty quickly after that. But it, for a while, is right up there. So she feels it's a fit place for her husband, who couldn't have cared less, to receive important people. <laughs> it makes her feel good to see her little man, um, who's taller than she is, by the way. And here he is, just, this is an image I love, because it's pretty soon after she does it. He's reading the first head of state Prince of Wales has been to the White House, but he is not a head of state, he's the Prince of Wales. This is the King of Hawaii who comes to meet U.S. Grant uh, in the East Room. I'm trying to think, he doesn't look that short, does he? He's 5'8", by the way. Next, please. And of course, unanticipated, Julius ends, and see, this, this essay I wrote actually goes into this more, because Nellie and Jesse are the children who really grow up in the White House. Fred and uh, Buck have already gone off to school and college, and they come back to visit. But Jesse is only 11 when they move in, and Nellie's only 14 when they move in. So they really live in the White House. And when Nellie is 17, her mother sends her to England to get her away from fortune hunters, because there are all these inappropriate boys hanging around the White House. And she immediately falls in love with an inappropriate boy who's older than she is, 
and turns out to be a real skunk, but, um, and they are married in the East Room when she is 17 years old. And, and, and you realize that she marries an Englishman, becomes an English woman, and goes to England. And that's basically losing your child, unless you can travel, and they do travel, but it, it's a much bigger deal than it would be now. Uh, and U.S. Grant weeps openly during the wedding, which seems a little tactless, but, uh, but he's <laughs> grieving over the loss of his princess, his child, his daughter. But there's a great shot of the East Room all de decked out for uh, the wedding, and as it looked on the cover of Leslie's Illustrated. Next, please. So they married off their daughter into a highly social, wealthy English family. At the same time, they marry off their oldest son, my great-grandfather. This portrait is in my dining room. He's repainted by George P.A. Healy in Washington in 1876, after they're married. They're married in Chicago in 1874. But Fred meets Ida Honoré, the daughter of a real estate developer in Chicago, at a party at her sister's house. And her sister is Mrs. Potter Palmer, whose husband is the most powerful real estate developer in Chicago in the Gilded Age. And Ida, I, my cousin uh, Eleanor has this portrait of Ida. And the way, reason she looks like this is she's pregnant, so she has this burnous wrapped, wrapped around her. I don't know how they could have painted her without looking pregnant, but apparently this was something they did. But this handsome young couple who meet in Chicago and are married in Chicago at the same time, the same year his sister is married. So she's married off her two, two of her, her two eldest children, her daughter and her eldest son, uh, to good matches. And this actually is a very good match, but we'll go on. Nellie didn't do so well. Next, please. And I'm not going to go into that too much. But so that now we've gotten them through the Gilded Age. But you've got to realize that one of the results of the Gilded Age are children. And when you have marriages, you have children. You know, that whole joke, when a man and a woman, never mind. Um, <laughs> and I, in, the, in, the, in the photo albums of a cousin in San Diego, uh, a descendant, so a descendant of Buck, the second son, who ends up in San Diego, uh, I found these photo albums, and I found for the first time ever pictures of my grandfather as a child. And so my grandfather is the little boy in the middle with the military hat with the pom-pom on it, and his big sister, Julia, is the one looking smug on the left. And the rest of these are Buck's children, Buck's three oldest children, Julia. So there's Julia and Julia, Julia two and Julia three, and Miriam and Chaffee. Uh, because Buck marries uh, Senator Jerome Chaffee's daughter, uh, Fanny. And unfortunately, Fanny is a family name until this day. And, uh, and I can tell you more stories about that. And then they will move to San Francisco, or to San Diego, and have two more children that U.S. Grant will not live to see. But uh, they are very close cousins. Buck and his brother, Fred, are good friends. And we think this album took place in upstate New York at their farm called Merriweather Farm, uh, just before Fred and Ida took Ulysses and Julia to Vienna for four years, when he became the American ambassador. Now, there's another story there. Let's see what the next slide is. No, oh, well, that's not what I was going to say, but I'll talk, well, I'll talk about this. Because so the Gilded Age, because Grant goes to Vienna later. Uh, but so Grant is in the White House, and he trusts Wall Street. He's already been burned any number of times by 1876 by various financial scandals. And I would say that if I have to say one thing about U.S. Grant that I've inherited is that he's gullible. He automatically assumes people are good. He's never suspicious. And even when people are shown to be bad, if they're his friends, he has trouble believing that they're really bad. He can't believe that someone he cares about, who he likes, could be a bad person. Uh, but just keep that in mind. So and, and I'm pointing this out because he sends a huge amount of money, $20,000. This was a check of mine that I've given to the Presidential Library to Joseph Seligman, which when I was a kid didn't mean anything to me. But the Seligmans were one of the major financial investment firms, uh, like Lehman Brothers in New York City in the 19th century. So U.S. Grant is investing his money wisely through one of the great uh, fi financial offices. But he knows Joseph Seligman because his son was a wounded soldier during the Civil War, uh, and Grant befriended him and took care of him during the Civil War. Uh, made sure that he was safe. So the Seligmans and the Grants have a, 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 a history, and so he invests his money with them. And $20,000 is an enormous amount of money. I mean, that's millions in modern money. So he's doing something with his money, and I'm just wondering what happened to it all, and I'll explain that later. 
Uh, next, it's not names, it's 564,000. I look at my own captions. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so Grant is in the White House, the Gilded Age is just steaming along, Mark Twain has written his book, which is about corruption in the government, and murder, and you know, all sorts of terrible things. It's, a, it's not a very good book, but it's a really interesting story. So if you're interested in that, read Mark Twain's The Gilded Age. He co-wrote it with someone else whose name I've forgotten, who apparently didn't write the good parts, as far as I can tell. But then at the end of his term, this, this great centennial exhibition opens, and I'm assuming, again, this crowd is going to know what the Centennial Exhibition is, but the United States Centennial Ex Exhibition uh, in Philadelphia in 1876 was the first big, successful World's Fair, although there had been one in New York City in the 1850s. And it's this great triumph of American industry and manufacturing, and the Corliss steam engine is started by U.S. Grant and the Emperor of Brazil, who's, who is in fact also the king of Portugal, but that's another story. Uh, and Julia writes in her memoirs that she's up on the platform with him, and they ignore her completely. So that's what she says in the memoirs. They're doing all this, and the men get all the credit, and I'm just standing there with my, you know, twiddling my thumbs. And then they leave. What do you do when you retire? You obviously have some investments, because you've been sending your money off, and you have no pension, either as an officer or as a president, Let's take all our savings and spend it traveling around the world. And, and it seems bizarre, and yet it becomes the greatest traveling adventure that any president has ever undertaken. Julia and Ulysses are more traveled than any president and first lady in the history of the country, because they go everywhere. And they spend two years plus visiting every head of state that they can get into. It starts out as a private tour, and it becomes a state tour. Even though he's out of the White House, the US government ends up paying for ships to carry him around the world. And Lena Campbell has written a book called Citizen of a, of a Wider Commonwealth. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, it's not as exciting a book as I wished it was, but it's a great story that talks about the, ex the remarkable nature that this man who didn't like to get up and give a talk gave extemporaneous speeches all the way around the world to the hundreds of thousands of people who came to see this hero who had saved America. So he and Julia get very full of themselves as they travel around the world, and she shops. He meets his equivalent in Hong Kong, uh, a man who overturned the Taipei Rebellion, uh, Li Hong Chang, whose descendants still exist uh, in China, or maybe in Hong Kong, for all I know. I've always thought this was funny because he's all dressed up for this formal pose, and he's got white socks on. And I don't know what the rules were for formal dress. <laughs> Next slide, please. So they take this remarkable tour, they come back, they burn through a lot of their money, invested in the Comstock load, I mean, they, they, and they spend a long time going from San Francisco through the West, they go to the Comstock load, they go to Mexico, they visit people, I think they go to Cuba, they go all over the place, Julia writes about this in her memoirs, and eventually they go back to New York, not quite sure what they're gonna do and what they're gonna do for money. And lo and behold, uh, people have gathered together in New York and bought them an enormous house, 27 rooms, just off of Fifth Avenue, and given them an endowment to take care of it. So things, once again, they were given a house in Philadelphia during the war, by the way. So and I, I point this out, because there's the grand house, looking rather smaller, and there it is. Uh, probably, it's probably closed up for a season, but this is the Havemeyers who developed Domino Sugar, and they built this massive house on Fifth Avenue, all decorated by Louis Tiffany. So that's a much more famous house. Uh, and I know someone, there's an apartment building on that site now, and I know someone who lives there. So I've been in that in the apartment building to replace that. But this is a house that my grandfather knew as a child, uh, because, well, let's see what happens next. 3 East 66 Street. Oh, I just have to show pictures because these were actually published in 1883 when the Grants were riding high. It was for, for, in a book called Artistic Houses of America. But for that book, this is a pretty modest house. But you can see the house is crammed full of souvenirs of their trip around the world. And notice the spittoon in the library where the men hung out. Uh, and uh, 
I've seen, I'm looking around here because I've seen some of the objects in this. Oh, I'll tell you a little weird story. That this group would like to see this painting here. That's the one thing I recognize because I know where it is. It's in the American uh, the National Portrait Gallery, but it's painted by Thomas Buchanan Reed. It's called Sheridan's Ride. It's a famous Civil War painting. And it was painted in Newark, New Jersey when U.S. Grant was visiting Marcus Ward in Newark, New Jersey. And Marcus Ward had one of these paintings, which is in the Newark Museum, and U.S. Grant had another one, which is in the Smithsonian. But it hung in the parlor of their house on 66th Street. There's one of those diversions. Next, please. And here they are, 1880, citizens of the Gilded Age. Julia's still not facing the camera and is a little plumper, but she's all cinched in with her corset, which must have been hellishly uncomfortable. And they are having a great time. They have a busy social life. They're friends of the Vanderbilts. They're, they're on the edge of the Gilded Age, though, because they don't have vast amounts of money. And they're not really quite right. I mean, if you watch the TV series, I'm sure Mrs. Astor didn't think much of the Grants. But they lived on 66th Street. They lived in the heart of the old money New York City, where the new money was already building up. William Henry Vanderbilt becomes a good friend of U.S. Grants and never cheats him. Amazingly enough, I guess he's rich enough that he doesn't need to pull one over on poor U.S. Grant. Uh, and, and they're having a great time. U.S. Grant lends his name. Okay, next slide. Let's see what I've got here. Ah, good. Uh, U.S. Grant, at his son Buck's insistence, Buck, who is the sort of the Gilded Age society boy of the four children, who marries socially, lives socially, moves to San Diego, and becomes a real estate person. But he has this friend named uh, Ferdinand Ward, who's, I don't think this is a very flattering picture, but he's apparently handsome and, and, a, and a smooth talker. And he convinces Grant to invest everything, who and convinces all of his family to invest everything they have in this firm called Grant and Ward, which is just raking in piles of money on Wall Street, because being a broker is a big deal, mm -hmm. until a day in 1884 when it all comes crashing down, because it's a Ponzi scheme. And before Ponzi existed, and Ferdinand Ward skips town, taking all the money with him and leaving Grant and his embarrassed family. So it really bankrupts the entire family and takes away whatever investments he had, and suddenly leaves him facing this, sitting with that big house on 66th Street, where his my great grandparents and their children moved from Morristown, New Jersey, back into New York to move in with their parents because everybody has to sort of retrench and figure out what they're going to do going forward. So, next slide, please. Grant goes to William Henry Vanderbilt. There's a picture of his art gallery on Fifth Avenue uh, and gets a $150,000 loan, uh, which Grant puts down all of his souvenirs from his military career and the trip around the world as collateral. And when he can't pay it back, when it all goes belly up, uh, Vanderbilt says, well, I I, I'm not going to make you pay this back, but Grant won't take back his stuff. So Vanderbilt gives it to the Smithsonian in Julia's name mm -hmm. after the general dies. Mm -hmm. And it's all still there, I think. I've seen pieces of it in the front hall of the History Museum, big Chinese vases and things like that that they brought back. So one, I have, I'm fond of the Vanderbilts because of this connection, because his great-great-grandson is Anderson Cooper, who went to Yale after I did. And yet, he never calls. <laughs> <laughs> I keep thinking that would be a way to meet him, but it's just not going to work. Next one. And then he's bankrupt, he's mortified, he's humiliated, he's being accused by everybody around him of having done something evil to have caused all this financial distress. And then he gets cancer, and then he discovers that he has inoperable throat cancer from all those years of smoking cigars. And lo and behold, someone else steps up, steps up the Drexels, Philadelphia, who have a who rent a big cottage at the Balmoral Hotel on Mount McGregor and give it to the Grants, uh, not knowing exactly how long he's going to live. But they go up there in June of 1885, and he is working on his memoirs. And the memoirs, someone here, where are you? You brought the copy of the memoirs. He starts writing the memoirs after he finds out he has cancer. He's suffering from pain constantly in his throat. And he writes two volumes of memoirs, 800 pages, that bring in 
an enormous amount of money and saves his family from poverty while he's dying of cancer. I can't work if I have a headache. So I, I just, to me, this is, and I was asked this once, uh, sitting next to the great-great-grandson of Jefferson Davis, what I thought the most important thing he was, the greatest thing he'd ever done. And to me, it's writing his memoirs. But this is the setting, and that's where we came in as the porch of that house. Let's go to the next slide and see what I put there. And here they are again. So just to repeat, so there's Ulysses and Julia, and Ulysses Jr., and Nellie, and Fred, and Ida, and Fanny, and Nellie, and Ulysses, and Julia, and Jesse. There they all are. And the, the whole idea of this is this Victorian notion of a good death. He knew he was dying. And what kept him alive was writing the memoirs. Fred was working as his secretary. By this time, he could only talk in notes. And a bunch of those notes survived, little handwritten notes to people. He'd write memos to Fred, change this, do this, see to that. Uh, and the family is all gathered in this house together. My grandfather is three years old, waiting for him to die. And when he does die, Fred stops the clock in the parlor, which is right there where it was in 1885, with the hand stopped at the time the U.S. Grand died. I should know that in time, but I don't. And so it's a remarkable moment that he lives right up to the end of his life, uh, defying all of the negative things that people say to him. And I think there's another slide. There's some more slides. Oh, here's the last photograph taken of him. He's only 63. So those of us who are older than that, uh, and, and as I say, the great U.S. grand impersonator is now 10 years older than that, so it's getting awkward. <laughs> and, and then this is that it's, uh, he, he pulls in, four, Julia gets $450,000 by the time her husband dies, which is more than enough to live on. And I always just assumed she spent it all, but I still get income from that money. Not very much, because there's a lot of descendants. <laughs> but that money is still intact. She kept that as a legacy for her children, but she lived well her whole life. And she lived knowing that her husband had given her that money, had done that. But also the book, if you haven't read it, you should read it. It's, a, it's still considered the greatest military memoir in American history, because his writing is so beautiful. It's so unflorid and unfussy. Clear because that's the way he wrote his memos as a general. And then and he was helped by Mark Twain. I love this image of Mark Twain as a, as a young man with red hair uh, because Twain is the one who set up the deal for him through a sort of his, uh, his son in law's publishing company in Philadelphia that probably didn't have any business anyway. But they all made out well on this because Twain gave him really generous uh, royalties on this. So he became. Grant's greatest friend at the end of his life. Next, please. And then, Grover Cleveland, who is elected to the presidency and comes into office in 1885. And he says this at the, at the time on July 23rd when U.S. Grant dies. The great part of the nation that followed him when living with love and pride bows now in sorrow above him, above him dead. He must have written this himself. It's a little awkward. I mean, not, it doesn't sound like a speech writer. It sounds like something from his heart. Tenderly mindful of his virtues, his great patriotic services, and of the loss occasioned by his death. But more importantly, and, and Grover Cleveland is at Grant's funeral, but the most important thing he does is he reinstates Grant's commission as general so that Julia will get 5000 a year as the widow of a general. That's a lot of money. That's a big, that's a nice chunk. It's not what he was earning as the commander of the armies, but it's a, it's a great, oh, this is out of Lewis's book, <laughs> an article he wrote. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, so I think that's something anyone tied to Grover Cleveland can be proud of, is that th this sort of shocking neglect of presidents then, not so much now, <laughs> and, uh, and the, the fact that Julia, that he was desperately anxious that Julia get his pension so that he wouldn't leave her destitute. And then he wrote the memoir, so it all worked out. Well, he died. <laughs> it didn't work out so well for him, but for his family, it worked out fine. Uh, and I, I must have one more slide in here. Oh, and here, yes. And oh, this is a good reminder. 
So here is April 27, 1897, uh, 12 years after he died. Lewis's book on the tomb is extraordinary because it was not, it was a slog, and it was a slog for a lot of good political reasons. We are not enthusiastic monument builders in this country. It's always a struggle. But U.S. Grant's tomb, because it was in New York, was a particular struggle. But here they are triumphantly. So here's his, there's Julia and his son Fred, my great-grandfather, my great-grandmother Ida, my great-grand Julia, my great-aunt Julia, and my grandfather, 16 years old, before he went military, wearing a derby, looking like, a, looking like, looking like, uh, uh, Larry Russell in the Gilded Age. <laughs> Some of you have been watching that, clearly. Uh, and what I love about that is we know that Verena Davis, Mrs. Jefferson Davis, was there. And now, I'm gonna, oh, now I have a whole little subset, so we're gonna finalize this. We're gonna take this to the end, because he's dead. The Gilded Age is still going, and the story carries on, because the seeds he sowed, literally and figuratively, uh, will carry on. Next, please, because this is a, because now we'll go back. So here's Ida. And this, and this will be very quick. Because there's Ida and her big sister Bertha, who becomes Mrs. Potter Palmer, the queen of Chicago society. Next, please. Ida builds this huge house the year U.S. Grant dies, the year the Valentine House is built in Newark on, on Lakeshore Drive in Chicago. An elaborate one they call the Palmer Castle. And it's this great Gilded Age house. But that's not really the point. But the point is, Bertha has a lot of money and no daughters. Who has a daughter? Her little sister has a daughter named Julia. Next, please. So, and so Ida, in Julia's memoir, she writes about this, but Ida takes Julia along to Europe in 1898 because her boys are with her, they're good friends, they're cousins. My grandfather is in West Point, and they go to Europe, and this Russian prince falls in love with Julia and comes to the south of France and asks her to marry him. And her own memoir, she's very coy about it, but uh, in my speculation, it's that she thought, okay, I can go back to Morristown with my mom and dad and not have any money, or I can become a princess and move to a castle in Russia. <laughs> so I think this is quite a love match. This is a like match. And this is, <laughs> right. this is the prince Mikhail Mikhailovich Hanukuzen and Count Speransky. They are married in Newport, which becomes Mrs. Palmer's crowning achievement in crashing Newport society as a Chicago lady. My grandfather is her best man, is her, walks her down the aisle, because her father is in the Philippines, fighting for the U.S. Army, because he's gone back into the Army. And here's another picture of Julia at the wedding with, with, uh, Julia, with her grandmother, Julia. That's Henry Honoré, her other grandfather. Uh, that's my great-grandmother, Ida, and Mrs. Palmer. So this became this great society event in Chicago, in Newport, in 1899. And then Mrs. Palmer went back to Chicago and never went back to Newport because she'd done what she needed to do. So keep this in mind as you're watching the TV series. Bertha Russell has nothing on Mrs. Palmer, who crashed the gates of Newport quite well. I also, also for, just because this is the kind of nerd I am, what you're seeing, she's wearing an enormous piece of lovely jewelry across her chest, which still exists, but unfortunately not in the family. So, but here's the wedding shots, looking moderately happy. Next, please. And then, this is where she goes. She goes to this huge estate, 20,000 acres in Ukraine, in Poltava, in a place called Borunka, uh, where the Kandy Kazane family live. And she has three children there, Michael, Bertha, and then the baby, Ida, who's the only one of those three I ever met. No, I did meet Michael once at my grandfather's funeral. And here they are back in Chicago, Ida smirking and Fred looking very generalissimo uh, with his sash, <laughs> with their two little princely grandchildren. Uh, needless to say, there aren't as many pictures of uh, the other grandchildren because they're not as fancy. But we'll, we'll skip over that one. Uh, next, please. And so here, you just, I love this image uh, of the two Julias. Julia leaves for all the fact that Grant's tomb is built in Washington, in New York City. Julia then sells the house and moves to Washington because Washington seems to draw people back. If you've lived your life in Washington and you're alone, somehow Washington is what draws you back and New York can't keep you. But here she is, she dies in Washington in 1902 and here she is in her house 
full of souvenirs uh, in Washington. The house still stands. They're about to put a plaque in front of it. And there's her granddaughter in the same time uh, as a Russian princess. And she enjoyed herself thoroughly and seems to have learned. Well, she learned how to write memoirs, but she didn't seem to understand the political ironies of being a child of the frontier living as a Russian princess. She was quite a she was known as the American uh, in mm -hmm. Russian society mm -hmm. and uh, was part of a liberal faction, if that makes any sense from that picture. Next, please. And meanwhile, her little brother is at West Point, uh, and he actually goes to visit them in Russia in 1901, but he goes back to West Point. He graduates in 1903, and he goes to work for, the, uh, for Teddy Roosevelt in the White House. Because Teddy Roosevelt worked with Fred Grant as a commissioner of police in New York in the 1890s, because Grant needed a job when he came back from uh, Vienna. And then Grant, Fred Grant, whines to Teddy Roosevelt to give his little boy a job at the White House, and, and U.S. Grant III gets a job at the White House, where he meets the Secretary of State's daughter, Edith Ruth, in the White House, and they get married, and they're my grandparents, married in 1907. Let's see what's next here. I'll skip through this. They get married in this house because the family is in mourning over the death of one of Julia's grandparents. Uh, I think this was the house that belonged to the Vice President, actually. So there's their wedding picture in 1907. So the Gilded Age is playing out. My grandfather was told as a young man that he couldn't coast on his name the way his father had and had to marry well. And he obeyed. But I knew them, and they were a very beautifully matched couple. So they were, uh, she was 29 when they married, and I suspect she was, she waited so long because she didn't, she wanted to marry for love. I speculated about that in my memoir because she didn't talk about it, of course. They never talk about these things. Next. And just to bring you right up to the end, grandfather and grandmother Edith and Ulysses with their two older daughters, Clara Frances and Edith. And then in 1916, their last child, a girl, alas, Julia is born. And that's my mother. And I love this photograph because this is my grandmother sort of in a Gilded Age way, giving the finger to all the people who have sent her mournful <laughs> telegrams about having another girl and therefore the name dying out. I asked my mother about this, and she said, I think he was relieved not to have any Ulysses to cope with. And that he had three girls he could educate and coddle, and, and he did. And he was a devoted father to them, and there's three of the three girls in 1918. You know, three, my mother's a little spoiled in the middle. Next, please. And then, just to jump way ahead to the end, in 1940, Julia Grant meets a young banker named John Dietz, in New York City, uh, who's from New Mexico. And at, he goes off to the war, and at the end of the war, he comes home early to get married. And they, she runs off to New Mexico to talk to his parents and calls her mother from Dallas and says, I'm getting married in two weeks, click. And, <laughs> and they did, they got married two weeks later at my grandparents' house in upstate New York. And there's my grandmother and grandfather and my parents at their wedding. My father was 26. He turned 26 on the day they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. So, and my grandfather was the head of civil defense in the United States. So, <laughs> it was a fraught moment, but they didn't realize the war was going to end so quickly. He was expecting to go to Japan. And finally, the last slide, the ultimate way of all dynasties. <laughs> the little kid with the gap teeth. <laughs> so that's my family in 1963. There's John and Julia and my siblings and me. This was the picture that did not get chosen for the Christmas card. <laughs> because I was smiling and they could see my missing teeth. <laughs> I found this in a box in the attic. I didn't realize it even existed. So anyway, I brought you up to the end, and I don't know if you see this as a happy ending, or a thoughtful <laughs> ending about what happens to dynasties. But thank you for listening.